Okay, so for chapter 18, which cover, covers viruses and other acellular infectious agents, I've actually divided this into three different audio lectures. Um, so the first audio lecture is going to give you an overview of viruses and structures. The second one is going to focus on um, more on the like, kind of life cycle, so viral multiplication or replication not reproduction <laughs> and then how do we look at that in the lab so how do we how can we calculate whether the viruses are replicating or not um, and then the third audio lecture looks at classifications of viruses and then also includes um, viroids and pyron diseases so um, again those are the three audio lectures this is the first audio lecture so again our focus is going to be on the structures that we see on vi in viruses so as you can see in the image here um, viruses have lots of different shapes um, and there's certain characteristics um, that when we talk about classification will help us to identify what type of virus we have based on the different shapes or genomes that they do have. So most of the information um, in this audio lecture is found in sections 1 and 2 of chapter 18. There's some terminology looking at acellular agents, um, and again, I had an infectious agents, um, <laughs> just to, for clarification that um, from a microbiology standpoint, these are in, um, potentially infectious. So virology is the study of viruses, so we have a whole entire course on viruses, so if you do find this stuff um, in, interesting, I would highly recommend taking that course. We are condensing in like a two-week time frame um, less than two week time frame um, what is actually covered in a whole entire semester. Uh, with virology the study the focus is on viruses and viruses are made up of protein and nucleic acids um, so viruses can be either DNA or RNA but they are not both um, so we can use the genome um, to classify and we'll talk about that in our third audio lecture so um, we can look at whether the virus is a DNA virus, meaning its nucleic acid is in a DNA form, or whether it is an RNA virus, and so again, whether its nucleic acid is an RNA form. Besides the genome, there are proteins that make up the capsid. Um, together, those make up the nucle nucleocapsid. We can also have glycoproteins involved, and we can also have membranes, and we're going to talk about those structures in more detail and with figures. There are also viroids. Viroids are only RNA. Um, there's no protein portion. It's just naked RNA that is infectious. So we see viroids infecting um, plants, and again, we'll talk more about that in our, our third audio lecture. Um, satellites are only nucleic acids, so those could be DNA, and then purons are protein only, um, and so those are a very interesting group because we usually think of because of central dogma that we need DNA to make RNA to make proteins. Um, so one would think if we had proteins that were infectious, um, it would only be the dosage we got that would cause issues, but purons actually can recruit other proteins to misfold. Um, in, in, we'll talk more about them <laughs> in our third audio lecture. I could keep going. <laughs> so it's important to keep in mind that there are viruses that can affect all cell types, and um, each virus would have a specific host that they would infect. So there are viruses that are known as bacteriophage, or phages, those are viruses that infect specifically bacteria. So obviously bacteria have certain structures like a cell wall potentially, an outer membrane. Um, and so that would mean that a lot of the viruses that can infect us can't infect, they don't have the machinery, if you will, um, the ability to infect bacteria. So again, it's a special group of viruses that infect bacteria. There are some archaea viruses we don't deal with those. <laughs> um, mostly what we'll be talking about is eukaryotic um, viruses, and there are viruses that can infect plants, animals, more specifically mammals, um, protistas, and also fungi. So again, um, there are viruses that can infect all different types of organisms, and then within there, most viruses have a specific cell type 
especially if we're talking about multicellular organisms, that they infect, and that's based on the receptors they have and how they interact with like glycoproteins. So when we look at this basic structure of viruses, um, we do have to talk a little bit about the classification or grouping of them. Um, so you'll notice in the figure below, we have this non-enveloped virus on the left, and then on the right, we have an enveloped viruses, virus. And so um, when we compare the two, what you'll notice is if you look on the outside of the virus, of the enveloped virus, it has an additional structure, right? And so that would be the envelope, which is made up of membrane that comes from the host cell. We'll talk more about that in a couple slides. And you also know that there's spike proteins, um, also referred to as glycoproteins. On the non-enveloped virus, again, what you notice is those are absent. What you see on both of these viruses is that there's the nucleic acid. And as mentioned, that nucleic acid can either be DNA or RNA, but not both. Um, and it depends upon the virus and what form the nucleic acid comes in. So whether it is double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA. And with single-stranded RNA, it can be what's known as positive or negative. And again, we'll talk more about that in when we talk about classification. And then you'll notice surrounding, which isn't really shown here, but the caps, it actually surrounds the nucleic acid and protects that. Um, so the capsid is made up of repeating proteins, and so it becomes this protein coat that, again, protects nucleic acid so it can't be damaged. In some cases, there is a single um, capsid. In other cases, individual segments of the genome are actually coated in these proteins. The structure altogether with nucleic acid and capsid is known as the nucleocapsid, so that's a term that you should know. Okay. We also want to keep in mind that viruses come in different sizes. So generally we think of viruses being small and they need to be viewed by electron microscope in order to see them. There are viruses that are larger, that are um, both from a genome standpoint and also from a size standpoint. So there are viruses that are just as large as bacteria. Um, <laughs> so the other term that you're gonna see on this slide is virons. Um, so virons, generally refer to viral particles um, or the individual virus. In many cases, at least historically, virons is a term that's used for an immature virus, one that doesn't necessarily, isn't capable of infecting the host cell yet. There might be some kind of um, process that needs to happen. So virons are usually found inside of the host cell. Once they are released, and for envelope viruses, this is when the envelope, um, the envelope is added generally. Um, and so in that case, um, that would be recognized as a virus versus a viron. Um, so just be aware that those terms, uh, I don't get too hung up on like using those interchangeably, but in some cases um, people do. <laughs> so you should be aware of that. Um, as mentioned, they come in different sizes and morphology as we saw in our, this figure in our first intro slide. Um, and so again, this just is meant to give you an idea of some of the differences. Um, all these are scaled um, to, be, to be the same proportion. Um, so they're all using the same scale. So in reference to each other, you can see the size difference from like the human papilloma virus um, versus mimeovirus, right? Um, and then you can see the different structures that we have in that T um, even um, bacteriophage that infects E. coli. All right, so as I mentioned with the capsid, um, these are going to be repeating proteins. Um, so those proteins, the protein subunits are sometimes referred to as protomers. Um, they're also referred to as capsomers. So this information would actually be coded in the genome. This is something that the genome has the genes for because that is unique to the virus, okay? And again, it, the capsid is meant to protect the viral genetic information, nucleic acids. It also can aid in the transfer or infecting of host cells. The capsid comes in different shapes. So there's helical, icosahedral, and then this miscellaneous category called complex. So here we see this 
um, helical capsule, so it has a helical kind of spiral sh um, staircase appearance to it. And so it actually has, it's hollow in the middle. So as you can see on the figure below, the RNA, which is the nucleic acid, the genome for this um, virus is in the middle. And then you have these um, capsomers or protomers um, that end up assembling around. There's no energy required for the capsid um, to assemble. So that's really important from a viral standpoint you're asking the host cell to replicate your genome, make the proteins from you, but then they will self-assemble, so you're not, requir you're not requiring the host cell to assemble the viruses, the viruses, the virons for you, okay? Um, so if you actually just put these um, capsid, capsomers, protomers into a test tube um, with their like copies of the genome, again, they would just assemble and make that regardless of there being no protein, pre no cell present, okay? Here you see icosahedral. So icosahedral, um, what happens is that there are 20 faces to it. So um, think of like a cube that's gonna have like eight sides to it. So these actually have 20 sides. And depending upon the size of capsomers, um, pentamers, and how they, um, uh, articulate, interact with each other, and how they fold um, will indicate um, exactly the size of the icosahedral capsid. And so again, you can see here, um, here we have an icosahedral, and then it actually has spikes coming out of it. And then the last category is the complex, and that's when they don't really fit into a helical or icosahedral. Um, so pox virus, which is an animal virus, it fault is one of those. So you can hear, see here, um, pox um, virus. And again, you can see from the shape, it's not helical and it's not icosahedral. Sometimes it can have additional um, structures. So you can see this like core membrane uh, that's around it. And then there's this outer envelope to it. So again, just its capsid is a little different. So it goes into the complex category. There's also the bacteriophage. Um, you guys should be pretty familiar with bacteriophage. Um, so we did some activities that we focused on bacteriophage. And again, these are the viruses that infect bacteria. So we're gonna um, switch over. And again, one of the things um, you'll notice in this slide, looking at this bacteriophage, it doesn't look like either or, right? So, um, so it's not, it has a capsid head that has a nucleic acid in it. Again, um, capsule proteins would make that up. But then it has these additional structures. It's got the collar, the sheath, it's got sh um, tail fibers, tail pins, and then these long tail fibers. So it kind of has a spaceship kind of, <laughs> you're docking onto the moon, but really docking onto a bacteria. These um, tail fibers allow for attachment um, to the bacteria. And then what happens is that sheath um, actually injects um, into through the cell wall, through the plasma membrane, which then allows um, the nucleic acid, the genome, to enter into the bacteria. So the structure actually doesn't enter the bacteria, it just docks to the surface. And then like a hypodermic needle, the nucleic acid is then inserted in. Um, the pan, the pan, panel B on the right, um, this is what these bacteriophage actually, actually look like under an electron microscopy. So um, focusing a little bit back onto viral envelopes. Um, so again, keep in mind that the envelope, um, viral envelopes are coming from the host cell. And so if we have a cell wall <laughs> that's very unlikely that you're going to have an envelope um, because a lot of times um, envelope viruses, they actually bud off from the cell. So again, what they're doing is incorporating some of the host cell membrane. In some cases, they can incorporate um, nuclear membranes or even ER and Golgi, but that most commonly um, it is the plasma membrane that it's incorporating as it is budding off after it's been assembled. Okay. The other component um, to think about is the viral enzymes. So viruses will actually, um, if there are critical enzymes that are needed in order for its replication, um, it will have enzymes enclosed in the capsid um, so that it's not immediately requiring the host cell to make enzymes for it. And that could be because the form of um, 
its genome doesn't allow protein synthesis initially. Also, when we look at something like retroviruses, um, they can bring their they bring the enzyme they need um, if needed. And then with the envelope proteins, these are these spike proteins or um, glycoproteins that are found on the surface. These um, allow for attachment to the host cell so they can act as ligands binding to proteins that are acting as receptors and that then signals the host cell to allow them to enter. Um, we use them to identify viruses. So um, you will talk about later on, but with like influenza, there's different strains there's different types of influenzas, and then there's different serotypes, so different H's and N's. So we can use these glycoproteins for influenza, hemagglutin, and neuraminidase to identify what virus is infecting people. Um, nowadays, we can also do sequencing too. <laughs> um, some of these, uh, some of these glycoproteins can have enzymatic. Um, activity, so they might be like neuraminidase, ACE tells you that that is actually an enzyme. So this can actually allow for um, signal, um, instead of just binding to the receptor, it might activate a receptor because it its enzyme activity takes the receptor from an inactive form to an active form. And again, we'll see examples of this later on. Um, and they can also play a critical role in the nucleic acid replication too. So important thing to keep in mind is that um, virus genomes are structurally diverse, right? And so again, we can use these to classify. And so when we look at their genomes, they can be single or double-stranded DNA or RNA. Um, and then the length of the nucleic acids can vary. So some viruses are only bringing a, their genome only codes for like two or three proteins. Other times, it could be a dozen proteins or more. And so, um, and in some cases with like RNA viruses, they can have segmented genome. So it's linear, but instead of just one linear piece, they can have multiple. So influenza is a great example of an RNA virus that actually has a segmented genome. And each um, segment is actually coded in capsimers into its own capsid. Genomes can also be circular, so again, um, we can use these to identify what type of um, virus we have. So if you do have any questions on any of the information related to the structures of viruses, um, please let me know. And again, this is the first audio lecture for Chapter 18. There are two additional audio lectures that will be posted.